The Ad Show. Hi guys, it's Adam and welcome to another video. So today, I thought I would do a five tips from five years of reselling videos. So yeah, this month I will have been reselling five years, which is... Honestly, I've thought about this day, or thought about this time of being reselling five years, and I never thought I would get here, but yet yeah, here I am. It's, it's really weird. So I've picked out five things that I've stumbled on and that I really feel are important things to do within reselling. Now, some of these go, well, maybe one or two of these go against what is the norm, I suppose, in reselling. Um, but I really do want to highlight these and actually give them a valid platform because uh, I think they are very important. So I've got them right, wrote down in front of me here. It didn't actually take me very long to compile these because I just thought of what I've done wrong or what I feel I've done wrong uh, based on, obviously, what I've observed from other people and what I've also changed myself and obviously the results from those changes and then thinking to myself, oh yeah, this is probably a better way of going about these things. So, all I did was, as I say, just picked out the things that I've stumbled across over the years and then wrote them down. So, number one is get it sold. Just get it sold. So long, I have done this thing where I will hold on to things for ages. And I will think, oh, they'll sell at some point, they'll sell at some point. Or the other thing is, I hold out for the highest price. Now, I'm not against someone holding out for a high price for a few weeks, maybe a month, something like that. Maybe one cycle round and buy it now. But seriously, if it hasn't gone, just cut the price, right? Would you rather have £30 in your pocket now that's tangible, that is real rather than £50 waiting three months. I know what I'd rather have. I'd rather have £30 now instead of waiting two or three months to have £50. Because if you've got that £30 now, you can go to the car boot straight away this week and turn that money, flip that money into more money. And it's something that I've not done for the longest time. So that's why I know that this is a much better way of doing things because... And also the reason I know this is because when I've been kind of deconstructing a business and I've been getting things sold, it's really, really odd how it's worked out. Because what I've done is I've maybe taken 10, 20% off these items, right? And suddenly, they, they may have been on for a year. They may have been on for a year or more, some of these items. But suddenly, they're active again and suddenly they sell. And it's almost as if they've, they've not been on the platform for a year. But then as soon as I just take that price down by 20%, they've gone. And I've had maybe maybe only 50p or £1 or £2 in terms of my capital invested in them. But why didn't I just get them out for 20% less when I could a year ago? Well, I've had to wait a year just to realise that through the fact of me deconstructing a business from a full-time position down to a part-time position. I mean, that's insane. Why, why didn't I get £10 out of them a year ago instead of having them on at £12, £13, £14 for a year only to take them down to £10 anyway and sell them at that price? I am certain that I could have got £10 for those items a year ago and flipped them fairly quickly so long as obviously i have a good title and i have good photos but in some cases these items are selling and they don't even have incredibly good photos or incredibly good titles yet they're still selling for a little bit off so it just it just really makes me think just get these things sold if you buy something for a five at the car boot and the top end is let's say 80 pound then brilliant, put it on for £80 for one cycle, for one 30-day cycle, let's say. Well, to be honest, it's good till cancelled these days, so you don't actually get really a 30-day cycle. Although saying that, they do just renew it automatically. So you could, you could kind of just go off your own kind of time scale of when you put it on and then think, right, it's been about three or four weeks or whatever. 
but obviously you don't necessarily relist these things. Although, if you're on auction, then you will relist. But I digress, anyway. So, um, yeah, you know, just think, right, I'll put it on at £80 for 30 days. But after then, let, let's cut it down to 60 quid. And I bet you... Pretty much no matter what that item is, unless it's a really, really obscure niche where there's not that many people searching for it. But if it's in the electricals niche or the toys and games niche or even in the books niche or whatever, if you cut that price down by 10 or 20 quid, it's going to go pretty quickly. It's definitely going to go faster than if you just had it sat there for ages and ages and ages at 80 quid. You've got 60 quid out of it. It costs you a fiver. Uh, and, and I'm... I'm I'm speaking to myself here in the past. I'm frustrated with myself in the past here um, at not doing those things and not getting that money out of it. it. It's barbaric, really. So get it sold, get things gone, turn that money over and keep doing it like that and you will have a much better time of it. Honestly, uh, I can almost guarantee it. You will have a better time of it. The only way this won't work or the only situation this won't work in is if you've got something on that is very very niche and that you do just need to stick on at a high price and just let the buy the right buyer come along for example some weird archaeological thing that no one's searching for except one person in guernsey who's about 58 years old or whatever and and they just happen to be interested in architectural architectural something architectural or whatever, and they're the ones to search for it. In that case, you're probably best just leaving it on for a fairly high price. But that's the only situation really in those unique, very very niche items that it's probably advantageous just to to leave it at a high price. But number one, get it sold, especially if it's in a niche that has good turnover there. Hi guys, so it's a few days later now and I wanted to record this second tip again because I felt that I could have articulated or expanded on what I was saying in a little more clearer manner. And this also leads us on to a side tip as well. And this isn't just a tip in business, but it's a tip in life. And if you make a mistake or if you feel you could have done something better, then just redo it and then make it better in the process. And that's exactly what I'm doing here uh, with re-recording this second tip. So it's quite a controversial one, this one. And maybe in the last uh, segment I did, but you won't see, um, I kind of maybe went down a bit of a, a path that essentially made it not very uh, clear or not very concise in what I actually meant with this. But essentially, this is don't buy storage. Now, I know that's controversial, so hold your horses. Don't go below in the comment section saying, oh my God, you know, we're meant to be growing a reselling business, all that sort of stuff. Why would you say don't buy storage? I mean this in a certain context. If your aspirations are to simply earn a fairly average full-time income from this uh, and you don't have major major aspirations for growth which this may sound bizarre for some people because some people do reselling to take it to the moon and stuff but we also have to understand there are a lot of resellers out there who don't do this to take it to the moon but just do this for a consistent full-time or a consistent part-time income. So when I say don't buy storage, I'm more talking to those people. If you are someone who really, really does want to grow this business, if you're maybe a younger person most likely as well, then yeah, fair enough. If the finances allow, and obviously if you need to actually grow because you're becoming restricted, then Buy a, an office, buy a warehouse, buy uh, storage in, in any kind that you may wish, uh, and then obviously grow it from there. But if you're someone who, as I say, is just making, wants to make this consistent full time or part time income, then essentially, why not do it within the confines of your own home? Why not do it within the confines of, of getting a shed or a garage or something like that and keeping it to that? There are many, many examples of people, of resellers on YouTube who do it from their home and make a full-time income comfortably and efficiently. And if that's the case, if you can actually do that and you're happy with that full-time income, why would you need to pay for storage? 
And the answer is, well, you wouldn't need to pay for storage unless you are someone who has big aspirations and wants to grow uh, into this kind of bigger business, essentially. But that isn't everyone, as we've highlighted. So, essentially, that's what I would say. Keep it in the confines of the space that you already own and that you already pay for, essentially, rather than paying out every month to possibly have some unlisted stock just mound up and probably be unorganized after a time period because what you'll do is you'll buy a haul, you'll cherry pick the best bits and you'll put it in your lockup, especially if you have a storage area like a lockup. If you have an office or a warehouse that has listed stock in, then you probably, and that you're there for quite a while uh, each day, you're probably going to keep it a bit more organized. So having an office or a, a warehouse is can be a little bit more efficient because it is kind of your full setup. But having just a lockup where it's external from your house and you maybe just have unlisted stock in there like I did, it becomes a dumping ground and you just end up cherry, cherry picking the best bits from a haul and then putting the, um, you know, the sort of the lesser quality bit in the lockup. And if you repeat that enough times, you can see what happens. You have a big full lockup full of maybe £10 items, £15 items, which is brilliant. And in your mind, you're thinking, well, this is great because I've got this lockup full of items. But the thing is, they just sat there. And yeah, you may pick out bits and bobs every now and then. But at the end of the day, it's not really that much, you know, you're not picking out tons, it's all just staying there, you're paying monthly for the lockup, and it's just this big, horrible, unorganised mess, and if if at any point you actually need to get rid of that lockup, um, then you're faced with this big, daunting task uh, of, of all this stuff that then you need to get rid of. Now, if you are a very, very organized person, which I'm not, and that's why, uh, so, you know, for, for some of my experience with having a lockup, my lockup had, had got like that, essentially. But if you are a really organized person, that may not happen, and therefore you, you can organize it a little bit better, or maybe it's that you've got listed stock in your lockup, and so again, you're more motivated to actually keep it organized. And so, in that case, obviously, it might be advantageous for you to get a lockup. But I would then say as well um, that, obviously, make sure the finances allow it because in certain places, lockups can be quite expensive. I'm up in the north and it's fairly reasonable here. But down in the south, I've heard from people it can be quite expensive per month. For me, I was paying for my lockup £72 per month, which some, for some people might, might sound quite a lot, but for the space I got, uh, that was pretty reasonable, especially compared with down south, where for the same sort of space or the same area, it could cost you maybe 150 possibly close to 200 I've seen as well. I mean, obviously, if you're around London and stuff, then it will cost you a lot of money. Um, but no, so it's for a fairly decent space like that, it's not too bad. Um, but obviously, you need to work into that, the finances and stuff like that. Now, if you do want to take the business away from your home, uh, maybe you don't want it around family life and stuff like that, then maybe getting an office would be advantageous for you. Maybe, uh, obviously, just taking that business, uh, planting it away from home, and then, obviously, try, uh, commuting there every day would give you a sense of, of, of mental separation and, obviously, physical separation as well. And uh, and that might be really good for you, actually. So there's also that kind of mental health side of it as well. Uh, possibly it might be advantageous to, to get storage, a, a, a sort of office facility because of that. But I would say, really, it makes sense if you're just wanting to earn a certain full-time income from this and you can do it from home and you've got these processes in place uh, to ensure you've got at least a, a fair bit of storage um, at home and you've got uh, you know, a listed area and you've got a packing area and you've got all these different things in place, uh, then why wouldn't you just do it at home and not stomach the cost of storage? So yeah, a little bit controversial, but that's my, that's my tip number two, don't buy storage unless uh, you fall into one of the categories that, that I have just specified there. Number three, this leads on to this one quite nicely, take advantage of freebies. So whether that be 
when you're on the eBay vouchers, if you've got a, uh, a store subscription, a medium store subscription featured, or the anchor store subscription, take advantage every month. And this is something I forgot to do for a bit. I forgot to use my packaging voucher, and then I started using it again. And for the last 12 months or so, I've actually remembered to use it every month. But eBay aren't going to promote this voucher incredibly well. I don't know whether some of you have seen, but for me at least, they don't send me a message for eBay anymore saying, here's your £10 voucher. And obviously, they're not going to promote it like that. And it was silly for them to do so, because what they could have done, what they do now, is simply put the little voucher code. Uh, if, for example, you go on the eBay packaging site, then you can go on, obviously, one of those listings, and then it'll say, get this item for 0, 0.00, right? And then you can, you know, you've got your voucher. But of course they're going to do that, because if they don't get as many people claiming it, then they're obviously, uh, it, it means that they're getting more revenue at the end of the day. So they're going to be a bit sly with it, and that's some of the tricks of business. And if you don't like that, then uh, you're not really inducted or indoctrinated into... Uh, really the, the kind of subtly manipulative side of, uh, of, of business in a way. And, uh, you know, you've got to be careful with that. And you've got to let, you're not going to let that kind of uh, intrude on your humanity and your kindness in a way. But also there is a little bit that within business. And so you, because they're not going to do things for you. So you've got to make sure that you take advantage of as many freebies as possible. It's on you to... Uh, obviously make sure that you're uh, cutting cost, costs as best you can and making your business efficient, effective, streamlined and, you know, as I say, cost effective. So freebies, not just in the packaging vouchers that you get, but obviously in packaging materials whenever you can find them. Uh, maybe you might be able to do a, a kind of agreement with some sort of uh, business that gets rid of I don't know, bubble wrap or gets rid of loads of newspaper and then you can take it off the hands for them and you can potentially get it for free, then that's brilliant. Maybe you've got family, friends, whatever it may be, packaging materials again. And not only these things, but even when you can get stock for free. When you're buying stock, try and think of ways of deals where you can get things included for free because obviously if you can buy it for nothing, well, buy it, if you can get it for nothing, then it doesn't matter what you get for it in terms of a sale price. And again, this goes back to point one. Let's say you get something for free from someone, right? Uh, then don't hold out for the highest price. Don't hold out for 20 quid if, let's say, it go, if that's like the high it goes for. Just, just sell it for 15 quid really quick. You've got it for free. And then, and then you again, you're turning things over. And uh, if you can do that regularly, then... That's brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant because you're really maximizing your effectiveness. Now, it's not always the case that you can just get things for free like that. In fact, it's I wouldn't say it's a rarity, but it's not really, really, really commonplace at least. So, you know, obviously you kind of have to think of clever ways of maybe not getting things for free, but trying to take things off um, the, the price that you're being charged. For example, if you're buying a job lot or something like that, you need to work on your negotiation skills and try and get a, a better deal. And sometimes it can be a little bit, um, you may feel, uh, some, some people, including myself, that, uh, oh, you know, you don't want to take advantage of people or you don't want to push it too much, but... You do have to have a little bit of kind of uh, solidarity there and you do have to kind of stick by your guns a little bit and make sure that you're not being taken for a ride. But ultimately, as I said before, don't let this kind of uh, little bit of a sort of harsh side of business, that little bit of manipulation or whatever, don't let that breach your humanity. Always have that in, in the background as well. Um, but ultimately, you know, your job is to get a good deal. So again, working out whether you can get, maybe even including freebies in the deal. So for example, when you're doing a bundle job, uh, just maybe cheekily asking, you know, maybe you see something on the floor of wherever you happen to be doing this deal and you think, oh, you know, uh, would you perhaps throw that in to sweeten the deal a little bit because, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not quite there, I'm not quite feeling this deal yet, but if you, if you threw that in, then yeah, I think I would be, I think I'd be about there. So Things like that. I mean, any anywhere and everywhere. I mean, obviously in this country, 
uh, dumpster diving, skip diving, it's a bit of a grey area of the law, so you've got to be careful with things like that. But let's say there's a skip outside someone's house and you go to the homeowner and you ask them about it and stuff and they seem to be fairly amicable with it uh, and they seem to be uh, pretty happy for you to do something with the skip and you maybe see something in there, then yeah, go ahead, do that if you would like. Obviously, it is a bit of a risk because of the whole verbal contract not standing up in a court of law and all that sort of stuff. But to be honest, the person's not going not, to... It's not going to be taken that far or anything. So, um, I mean, if it's a business and let's say you don't ask anyone and then you take out the skip, that's when you can get yourself into some, tr some trouble. But if you ask someone, you know, private property, I'm sure they'll be perfectly fine with it. And uh, you, you, again, you get something for free there. You're just making connections talking to people all this sort of stuff to get a little bit of some freebies and then that means you don't have to pay for stock in certain situations and that means you can get ultimately more profit so number four is well kind of relating to this buy in bulk and buy job lots and also as a tag on for this find contacts honestly the best hauls I have ever had come from contacts. I've Some of the big, huge hauls I've had, which have been brilliant, uh, have all come from contacts. Even the bigger charity shop hauls I've had, as you've seen on this channel, have come from contacts at charity shops. Contacts are absolutely brilliant. Um, they make your life so much easier within business. It means that you can do big deals and it also means you can wangle more stuff for cheaper rather than just going around the car boots of the charity shops or wherever it may be and picking up little single items for one or two pound. You can do big job lots and it means you can really, if you're savvy with your ne negotiation, you can really bring that price down. And then if you can bring that price down, you can flip it on eBay and again your profit margin increases because your buying price has decreased. So I would say buying in job lots is a huge one. Getting to know contacts. Where can you find contacts? Well that's a hard one really because it's simply just about putting yourself out there. I mean car boot you might be able to find a contact for example the house clearance guys or whatever you might be able to get uh, talking to them and you might be able to think oh actually you know uh, they have some stuff, I obviously need stuff, um, may maybe you can do some sort of deal and maybe it's some sort of regular deal that you can do with them. But again, I mean, it's kind of what we call low hanging fruit because a lot of the um, house clearance guys, they'll probably have a lot of other people they're already doing that with and and maybe you don't get as much quality or maybe you can't really, maybe you can't actually do much of a deal with them that you were first thinking you could because it's fairly easy accessible to a lot of people, but maybe you might be able to find contacts when you're talking to people at charity shops and stuff like that. It might even just be very serendipitous or um, just coincidental, really. You might be in a charity shop and someone in that charity shop needs to get rid of loads of stuff. Maybe they're, um, I don't know, maybe they do a lot of auctions or whatever it may be, and maybe they're going to be a new source of stock for you. I mean, it's happened before where resellers have found valuable long-term contacts in a charity shop, not from the charity shop managers or anything like that, but just from random people being in the charity shop at that moment. And maybe they overhear that you're a reseller or you even just have a chat to them just randomly and you just happen to casually mention the fact you're a reseller and that comes into the equation. YouTube is another big thing. If you're a reseller on YouTube, you'll find you'll get people from time to time messaging you on Instagram, on Facebook, on, on your comments on YouTube saying, would you be interested in this? Would you be interested in the other? I've had this countless times, not only with just obviously buying things and, and actually gaining new contacts from, from having a YouTube channel, um, but also selling things as well and things like that. So essentially there's so there's literally so many ways i mean you go to an antiques fair or you go although saying that that's more retail so it's it's unlikely that you might find a um uh someone there who is going to be a contact who you can actually buy from at really really good prices but i mean auctions might be a way i mean you could get chatting to people at the auction house potentially that might be some way of finding a contact but many many different ways you can obviously go online as well but again it, it's probably a bit harder to find contacts online there are facebook pages set up for wholesalers and things like that but 
these wholesalers a lot of the time um, they might not be the best quality or they might not give you uh, they might give you okay prices or whatever but they just might be kind of again what we term low hanging fruit and it means that um, it, it's maybe not the best quality of stuff that you could potentially get so it's always good if you can maybe make an arrangement with someone uh, that's a little bit harder to make because when you make those harder arrangements it might be an indicator that actually uh, the stock you're going to get the, the relationship that's going to develop is uh, much stronger and much harder to, for other people to access than let's say just making a contact down the car boot or just making a contact online but then again saying that we have to counter that with the idea that many resellers have made slightly harder to make connections with people at the car boots as well so it's not all low hanging fruit essentially even down the car boot so that's number four number five this is perhaps one of the biggest ones i'd say probably Number five and number one are probably, well, to be honest, no, but they're all, they're all valuable tips. I can't actually say just one or two of them, but do one thing really well. Now, if you've been a follower of this channel for a long time, you will know I have done Amazon, I've done eBay, I've even had stints on Etsy of doing little bits, which I've not really talked about too much on this channel. Um, I've done bits and bobs here and there, all the rest of it. And uh, I flipped mainly back and forth between eBay and Amazon a lot. And it's, I think in the long run, it's actually been worse for my business to do that than just to concentrate on one single platform. Because uh, have you ever heard this thing, uh, Jack of all trades, master of none, that very famous saying. It's very, very true. And I've been quoted that by resellers in the past. And I've brushed it off and I've said, oh, no, I'm just going to do multiple platforms. I, that's the way I work and all the rest of it. And while I got a lot of enjoyment and while uh, I've really enjoyed multiple platforms, there has to be a, a real precise kind of view of what is going on here and whether this is the best thing that you can possibly do and in the long run i think i would say to myself really uh no i would have probably been better off either just sticking on ebay or sticking on amazon this way i mean you can master both platforms but the problem is juggling them that's that's the way i mean and even if you do master both platforms in a sense of you know what's going on with them, you know how to do everything on them, you know all the admin sides, you know all the news that's going on around them, all that sort of stuff, you still have to juggle them. And, you st and that's still a challenge. And if you've not got staff, which obviously I'm assuming if you're a small-time reseller, you wouldn't have staff uh, because no one really does who's a small-time reseller, then you're not going to be able to juggle that incredibly effectively. And I'm not, I'm not saying you can't do it. But I'm saying that it might actually be more beneficial in the long run to actually just go on one platform. Obviously, I can't say that you can't do it because I've done it. I've been able to juggle eBay and Amazon before. But it's kind of a trying to keep up the balls or trying to keep up the spinning plates. And it's not really, um, you know, really... Uh, being incredible on both the platforms now if let's say you're a reselling couple or there's uh, two of you in the business fair enough go for two platforms because then you've got you've got a bit more manpower but if you're just a person on your on their own like me or like anyone else really or a lot of other people then doing the two platform thing is gonna be taxing on you so I would say stick to eBay, master it, know the news, know all the admin, know how to do everything, teach yourself and anything you can on YouTube, on reselling, on what to buy, on uh, how to really get um, a uh, kind of self-awareness of how to buy things and understand yourself, not just going off other people's videos and saying, oh, I probably should buy this or I probably should do this this way, but actually having a little bit of independent thought within yourself so you know what you're doing because no businessman can survive without any independent thought. You need to break away from the sheep, break away from the herd, and you need to do it the way that you're going to do it. That would be a, a sixth tip, really, in a way. Um, but yeah, break away from the herd and really 
look at one platform in depth, really get in there and uh, and then you'll be able to succeed on that platform. And then let's say you're really, really flourishing on that platform after a number of years. And I would go to the extent of saying after a number of years, most other people say, uh, oh, after six months or after 12 months, that's exactly what I did and I may have made a little bit of a mistake there. But after six months or 12 months, uh, oh, you all like go to another platform. I would say build up one platform, get to know one platform incredibly well um, over a number of years. Then if you would like, you go on another platform and only if, only, only if, I can't stress this enough, that you really feel you have got the time to be able to do that move. Because if you haven't got the time and you're kidding yourself and you're thinking, oh, actually, I just want to go over that to the other platform because you're getting a little bit, you know, itchy or whatever. I don't know what the phrase is, but, you know, you're getting into that kind of uh, anxiety. Oh, I want to I want to go over to the new platform. Really excited. Well, if you're getting yourself into that, then you might not be actually looking at the fact that well enough and you might actually be making a move that would be a, a a wrong decision for you really and it might take too much time away from your main platform and then obviously that's going to suffer for it and you might not make it on the new platform you don't know you've never been over there, there, there before how do you know you don't you just put in your faith and hope in, in in yourself and in the platform and that's all well and good and that's something that you should have in yourself. You should have faith and, and hope within yourself, but you don't know whether it's gonna work out. So it's always better to make sure that you have that first platform honed down incredibly, you have the time, you have the efficiency, all that sort of stuff before you even consider doing that move to another platform. So that's my final tip. Do one thing really well. And we are coming up to 30 minutes on this video now. Um, I know it was a big old ramble, but there was a lot of good information in there. I promise you, I can promise you there was good information in there. You may need to watch it back again. Um, but yeah, um, that is what I've learned really. The five kind of main things over five years of reselling. I hope you enjoyed that video, guys. I hope you got some worth from it. And uh, if you haven't already, then obviously please consider subscribing to the channel. We do reselling and investing content on this channel. Hit the bell as well so you get notified of new videos. And also, if you would, if you did enjoy it, then please do give it a like. And I will leave it there, guys. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next one.